So it's my pleasure today, it's my job to uh, present uh, this year's Ian Donald Gold Medal uh, Award. And you know, I'm really pleased that uh, I can uh, make this award to Professor uh, Steve Goldstein. So perhaps we can start by uh, congratulating Steve on his award. <laughs> Uh, but Steve, it's only, uh, it's kind of downhill from here as far as this talk goes. Um, I guess one of the questions one has to ask is, um, first of all, you know, why is the Ian Donald Gold Medal Award uh, actually awarded? And I think Dario showed the same slide uh, for the Stuart Camel Award. I just want to focus on the fact it's for someone who's changed the way ultrasound is practiced uh, through research or through innovation. And I think Steve uh, encapsulates that. Um, but I'd say a little bit more than that. I think what Steve has been has been actually an inspiration to so many people who have uh, been carrying out ultrasound in gynaecology. Um, I was looking back on you know, what Steve has done. This is going back to 1990, even earlier. And um, I was talking to Steve last night over dinner and I was reminded him of a time when I first met him and how much impact it had on me. Steve couldn't remember, thanks Steve, but for me, um, it really encouraged me to carry on uh, working in gynecological scanning. And I think we talked about mentors just now and how important they are. And Steve Goldstein has been a mentor to many people. And it seems certainly to some people he didn't even realize uh, at the time. So the question I ask is, when you, people are very young, can you spot talent? So uh, anyone spot Steve Goldstein in this picture? I'll challenge you. Um, there he is. Um, questionable dress sense, I have to say. Um, I'm not sure things got much better when he was at college. There's some, um, I, if you want to blame anyone for these photos, Steve, they come from Wendy, I, I think. Uh, and these days, I think it's fair to say, Steve, I'm not entirely sure we'd have picked you out as a guy who's going to have such success academically. You seem to be focusing mainly on your hair. Um, it took me a long time to figure out there whether you actually had any swimming trunks on at all but I, I, I reassured myself that actually that was the case. So, however, despite this performance at college, um, which you know, graduated from NYU, and then you did your residency um, uh, at NYU, and of course you've been at NYU as a tenured professor pretty much ever since. You are the epitome of New York, it has to be said. And then you appear in the literature, so you were well, fortunate, I think. I think you must, must have had one of the first vaginal scanning probes in the States. And you realized straight away the potential um, and how this would impact on gynecological scanning. There are people who do huge randomized trials. There are people who have massive multi-center databases. But somebody has to spot the potential of a technique and actually do some of these first observational trials which other people then take and build into big databases. And this is, in my view, Steve's greatest contribution. So Steve first appears here in 1983, where he describes essentially the features of ectopic pregnancy uh, with vaginal scanning. So we're talking about 40 years. I'm sorry to tell you this, Steve, but 40 years uh, of carrying out ultrasound in gynecology. And then following that, Steve, essentially, because he's, I would think he'd describe himself as a clinician researcher and with a huge amount of clinical experience, recognized several of the things which people have subsequently worked on and uh, made careers on, but in fact people forget that actually Steve was there first describing these things. So for any young researcher who's thinking about a project at the moment, and I can see some of the fellows over there at the back, just ask yourself, just check that Goldstein hasn't been there already, because it's, it's kind of quite likely, and it's deeply annoying. Um, and I just went into PubMed and just had a quick look at some of the things that Steve uh, did here back in sort of the, the, the 80s. Um, and if you look at the application of ultrasound in gynecology, some of the principal applications are in diagnosing endometrial pathology. Well, you know, Steve was right there at the beginning, describing the use of ultrasound in that context, talking about cutoff levels. He talked about diagnosing ovarian masses with ultrasound, and he was one of the first people to say, look, you know, we can look at the morphology of these masses, and we don't have to carry out surgery. We have to wind back, wind forward to the, to the Art of Five study, which was about three years ago, to actually show a bigger study that actually showed 
that what Steve said way, 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 way back was actually true. And I can see some of my fellows there who are working on subcolonic hematomas, interstitial pregnancy, probe cleaning, which has become a big issue recently, and how we talk about pregnancy failure. And I'm really sorry to tell you that he did it back in the 80s most of the time. So he was very much ahead of the game. And he remained active, and he has, I'm sorry, I'm a bit like Eve, it's not an obituary, Steve, don't worry. You remain active, <laughs> um, and he's continued to make contributions, whether it be to guidelines to diagnosis of miscarriage, which I think is one of the you know, most important things that have changed of recent years, how to describe ovarian masses and diagnose ovarian cancer, and he has just continued contributing to the field. Um, but as I say, a lot of this stuff, Steve was there first with innovation, and he was able to describe it. And not only that, he designed equipment which would enable you to actually do some of these scans. And Steve, it gives me great pleasure that every time I do a hydrosonography, I know there's a little bit of money going into your pocket. Makes me feel very good about that. A few basic facts about Steve. Obviously, we know he's at NYU. He became full professor with tenure at NYU in 1996, so a while ago now. But I think what isn't known to everyone in the ultrasound community is parallel to this. He's had similar success and impact in the world of menopause, having been president of the North American Menopause Society, the International Menopause Society. And of course, he's had numerous positions and so forth uh, in the States, particularly uh, related to the use of ultrasound, particularly in gynecology. And he has had a long-standing relationship with ISWOG. I mean, he was there right at the start, being involved as a member from 1990. And I think some of you will recognize a few of the characters. Kipros, as we've just seen previously, being you know, a permanent feature throughout. But you know, he's you know, right up there, you can see, with Beryl Banaswaf, sadly not with us now. Stuart, Kipros, and there in gynecology, uh, you've got Steve Goldstein. Um, and I think it's only fair to acknowledge some of the people he's worked with over the years. You've got Larry there, and of course, Elan, uh, who, um, with whom he, he wrote what is one of the absolute classic textbooks uh, of ultrasound in gynecology. So, um, not only in research, but also when it comes to ISWOG, Steve has made a very big contribution. Other people have recognized this. You know, he's a fellow at Aundum of the college in London numerous awards uh, in the States from the IUM, and uh, he also, of course, uh, in the menopause world, has received many awards as well. So, um, ISWOG is not alone in recognizing Steve's contribution. Just a personal note, um, I started scanning at King's 1989, um, and when I went to King's, no one did gynecological scanning and no one had done any vaginal scanning, so I had to teach myself, which of course we don't do now, but that's what you did. What did I do? I found there was a book, Steve Goldstein's book. Uh, and this was, this was the Bible for me, you know, and the images in that really did inspire me to sort of take up ultrasound. And the first time I met Steve, as I said, was in San Antonio in Texas. Um, so I went to my first meeting and presented data. This is me in San Antonio, taking the meeting extremely seriously. I remember um, being rather stupid. I thought it would be a good idea to hire an open-top car in Texas and it's sunny, um, so that was a, a good bit of sunburn. But when I wasn't doing that, uh, I was presenting my abstract, and I was with Seth Granberg, who's a big name now, big name in ultrasound, made a huge contribution, Rudiger Osmers, Margot Volkson. We presented our data, Steve was chairing, and of course we knew who Steve was, and it was Steve who had the time and bothered after we'd presented to come and talk to us, encourage us, tell us where we'd gone wrong. And that, as I said, made a huge difference. And every time I saw Steve subsequently, he has always had the time. When I was a trainee, but with trainees, I've seen him in so many meetings after a talk, going to talk to them. And, um, and here we have one of my fellows, Chris Kiriakou in London, and Steve always having a comment, something to say, and always encouraging trainees in what they're trying to do. And I think that is hugely important to the future of our specialty. So on a personal note again, I mean, I've known Steve for many years. I mean, in many ways, he's almost part of the family. So thank you for being a great friend over the years. Um, Steve, we've had a lot of fun. And as you can see here, he's also, uh, I think in gynecological scanning, one of the great things is people are we have a very good network of people who I think all count each other as friends. And so 
you know, for me, uh, it's really, really a pleasure to be able to present you, Steve, uh, with the Ian Donnell Gold Medal for all you've done, both in research and for everyone who works in it. Congratulations. Well done, mate. You're the best. <laughs> okay. Well done. I just hope someday I get to do it for you. Well, uh, <laughs> who knows? He didn't After show you. the best picture. After you. <laughs> If you want to say a few words. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, do you want that? <clears throat> okay. Well, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, in my opinion, this Ian Donald Gold Medal is truly the highest honor that can be bestowed on someone in our field. Uh, and when I look at the list of previous winners, I'm truly humbled to stand before you and be included in such a group. But understand that I am not a sonologist. I have always considered myself a gynecologist who uses ultrasound, not simply a sonologist. I see patients, I scan patients, and I use that information to care for these patients. Uh, I've entitled my talk, The Surge in Medical Ultrasound, What Can Our Colleagues Learn from the Gynecologist? Or stated another way, if you do POCUS, known as point of care ultrasound, please don't reinvent the wheel. So in 1990, I wrote the following article incorporating endovaginal ultrasound into the overall gynecologic exam because in the States, people were sent to radiology, it was done by a technician, and report was generated. Kevin Goodwin was the initial CEO of Sonosite when it was spun off from ATL before Philips acquired ATL. And, and Kevin claims that I was the first person in the US to do POCUS, point of care ultrasound, before it was known as POCUS by describing this ultrasound enhanced by manual exam as part of the overall gynecologic exam and as I said previously, virtually all ultrasound was done by technicians, better known as sonographers. So as you saw in my first book, Endovaginal Ultrasound, I coined a phrase, sonomicroscopy, because I put forth to you that ultrasound gives us a degree of image magnification. That is, if we're doing ultrasound through a low power microscope, we are seeing things with ultrasound that you could not appreciate if you could hold the structure in your hand at arm's length and squint at it. Here is cardiac activity contained within a three millimeter embryo 45 days from the last menstrual period. If you could hold this in your hand at arm's length and squint at it, you would not appreciate cardiac pulsations contained within that structure. We're doing ultrasound through a low power microscope. It's one of the beauties of the technique. It's also sometimes some of the foibles. We must be careful not to overinterpret findings that may be much more common and less ominous than previously believed. We have to ascertain the incidence of anatomic findings in asymptomatic patients. There are a variety of situations where we need to learn to sit on our hands. And in my, I guess it's now 40 years, I thought it was 36. I've witnessed numerous examples in gynecology where benign but incidental findings are much more common than previously appreciated. For instance, when first introduced, ultrasound too easily revealed cystic ovarian changes, which initially were assumed to be pathologic. And many postmenopausal women were operated on for fear of these structures being malignant. So you all, well, if you do any gyne ultrasound, have all seen pictures like this. This is a simple unilocular, simple cystic structure in a postmenopausal woman. In 1986, this was the first paper published addressing the topic, the significance of the postmenopausal simple adnexal cyst. And that paper involved 13 patients with sonographically detected simple cysts, one of which supposedly had a borderline tumor. And those authors recommended immediate surgery, which was the standard of care in the 80s. We published the second paper on this subject, the postmenopausal cystic adnexal mass, the potential role of ultrasound in conservative management. And what we concluded in that paper 
was it small, less than five centimeter, unilocular, unilateral, postmenopausal, adnexal cystic masses with no septations or ascites, we didn't have Doppler, would have a very low incidence of malignant disease. We had zero out of 26 surgical specimens. And we said, therefore, serial ultrasound follow-up without surgical intervention may play a role in management. We were timid because that was not the standard of care. By 1982, Debbie Levine and Barbara Gosink had scanned 184 asymptomatic women. 17% had a simple adnexal cyst. The University of Kentucky Ovarian Cancer Screening Program by 2003, 15,000 women greater than 50, 18%, 18% had a unilocular cyst. So the crucial take home message, unlike the cervix with its dysplasias or breast with ductal carcinoma in situ, lobular carcinoma in situ, the endometrium with its hyperplasias, where I spend much of my day as a clinician looking for these pre-cancers before they become malignant, there's no evidence whatsoever that this is true in epithelial ovarian cancer. In other words, benign cyst adenomas do not become cyst adenocarcinomas. And so finally in 2009, the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound had a consensus panel that I was fortunate enough to be part of. And they concluded in postmenopausal women, simple cysts less than seven centimeters are almost certainly benign, and that yearly follow-up, at least initially, was what was recommended. It wasn't until 2016 that ACOG finally stated, with rare exception, simple cysts up to 10 centimeters in diameter are likely benign and may be safely monitored without surgical intervention, even in postmenopausal patients. Another example, the postmenopausal endometrium. On ultrasound, the endometrium should be a thin, distinct echo, which really represents the interface between two sides of inactive atrophic endometrial basalis. Oh, and if you do any gyne ultrasound, you've seen pictures like this. This is a long axis view of the uterus. The thin white line is that interface between two sides of inactive basalis. So we published the first observational study on transvaginal ultrasound and postmenopausal bleeding in 1990. Since then, in large conformational studies, the finding of a thin distinct echo, less than three or four or five millimeters, has been shown to effectively exclude significant tissue in these postmenopausal women with bleeding. And finally, in 2009, that's 19 years after our observational study, the ACOG GYN practice committee stated, when transvaginal ultrasound is performed for patients with postmenopausal bleeding and an endometrial thickness less than or equal to four millimeters is found, endometrial sampling is not required. But there's a big difference between incidental findings in asymptomatic women and those women who are bleeding. So what have healthcare practitioners heard and many unfortunately still do? Well, if less than four or five millimeters in bleeding patients is good, well, then if anybody more than four or five must be bad. But remember, all this data came from women with bleeding. And so I published this paper, The Endometrial Echo Revisited, have we created a monster? So the important questions are, how common is a thick echo in these non-bleeding patients? And when it is present, what is its significance? Well, Anna Parsons, a good friend of mine, studied women who wanted to be in the raloxifen uterine safety study. These were healthy postmenopausal women coming to be uh, in an osteoporosis study. 10% of these healthy women had an endometrial polyp on sonohysterography, 10%. Eva Dreisler really gets credit though. She had convinced 169 postmenopausal women to undergo transvaginal ultrasound and sonohysterography. 13% had an endometrial polyp that was asymptomatic. But Enrico Ferrazzi in this multi-center trial from Italy really nailed it. 1,152 asymptomatic postmenopausal women who had a diagnosis of a polyp by saline infusion sonohysterography, what we call SIS, underwent hysteroscopic removal. There was one cancer in a polyp. There were three perforations, seven cervical tears, and three false passages. So in postmenopausal bleeding, sure, the, even students are taught 
This is cancer until proven otherwise. And we understand the role of the high negative predictive value of a thin distinct endometrial echo when we're able to see it. But for an incidental finding of endometrial thickening with no bleeding, there is no validation whatsoever that all these patients need automatic sampling. In fact, the incidence of a thick echo on the endometrium is probably 10 to 13 percent. And it's very much like that simple cyst of the ovary was 20 more plus years ago. It is still appropriate and always was, though, to use some clinical judgment. If these patients are high risk, if they're obese, diabetic, hypertensive, have a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, then you can not use a magical cutoff. Additionally, there's a difference between having an incidental ultrasound finding and having a disease. And a gynae example of this in my mind is adenomyosis. Its incidence depends on how hard you look for it. It can result in pelvic pain, uterine enlargement, heavy abnormal bleeding, but it can also often be asymptomatic. So here's a typical transvaginal scan of a patient with marked endometriosis, uh, sorry, adenomyosis, all the classic stigmata, you don't see any endometrial echo. The prevalence of adenomyosis is very high, especially if you've got this sono microscope that I told you about. And if such patients are labeled with a disease, and if abnormal bleeding symptoms develop subsequently, in other words, they become perimenopausal with erratic hormone production, and these symptoms are blamed on the adenomyosis and then surgery is undertaken, even though it may well be incidental and not causal. So why am I telling you all of this? Most of you know much of this already. This article in the New Yorker magazine, could ultrasound replace the stethoscope? And I want you to, can we get the sound? You promised me the sound would work. <laughs> can we go back? Chad? This is too good to pass up. We're going to be able to one more try. He promised me it worked. Is it going to work? It's really too good. That not to the do. days of the stethoscope are gone. So it's been a good run. It's been a good run stethoscope, but it's time for you to retire because there's a new kid on the block <clears throat> and that is this. This is the Butterfly IQ Diagnostic Ultrasound. And this little device is going to change the way that medicine is practiced. It already is changing the way that medicine is practiced. This is gonna replace the stethoscope. This little device plugs into my iPhone. And with it, I can instantly look at a patient's interior without radiation, uh, without any big fuss. I can scan their neck and I can look directly at their carotid artery. I can see how much blood flow there is in there, if there's any blockages, how much calcification exists. I can look at their gallbladder and see if they have any stones. I can check the meniscus of their knee while they move their knee and I can see if the meniscus is injured. That the day so, must history repeat itself? Will dissemination of ultrasound throughout all the other medical specialties emergency medicine, musculoskeletal, anesthesiology, internal medicine, specifically this POCUS, caused them to reinvent the wheel. I wonder if you scanned 150-year-old men who are totally asymptomatic, how many will have an abnormal meniscus where any complaints they may have would be unrelated to that ultrasound finding? Or some carotid plaque easily visualized that may be age appropriate and not clinically relevant. Oma is from the ancient Greek. It's a suffix meaning tumor or other abnormal growth often attached to a body part. So an incidental Oma is a radiologic neologism to denote a lesion found incidentally and of dubious clinical significance. I have a cyst in my kidney, one in my liver, and a hamartome in the right lower lobe of my lung all of which were discovered during imaging studies for other reasons. So earlier this year, 
I gave a webinar to a global audience of young future leaders for the International Menopause Society entitled Gyne Ultrasound, Whether You Do It or Order It. And the young Irish practitioner taught me a new word, vomit, victim of modern imaging technology. So must history repeat itself? Will the current surge in the use of POCUS across so many medical disciplines result in more and often unnecessary additional imaging or more and often unnecessary surgery? I hope not, but my take home message Ultrasound is a wonderful non-invasive tool to see things previously never easily accessed. However, first, as obstetrician gynecologists, we must understand what constitutes normal. In other words, what is the background noise before we act on findings that may be much more common than previously appreciated and often clinically inconsequential? Next, we must share such information with our medical colleagues so they can adopt our wonderful technology and understand what is common in their respective fields and not necessarily pathologic. We need to help them avoid many unnecessary interventions, resulting in increased patient anxiety, further imaging, and even surgeries. Remember, above all else, do no harm. And so I thank you for this Ian Donald Gold Medal, and I thank you for your attention. Once again, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Okay.